Lord. A couple of questions I have for you. Number one, are you daily charting a course toward your dreams? It's not wrong to dream. I hope you like my kangaroo. You like that? It's because I come from a land down under. No. <laughs> Later we're having Vegemite sandwich. No. No. I, it's a, think about this. It, many times we draw reference to the hind's feet or the deer's feet that scales big walls or, or rocky terrain. But why don't you just be a kangaroo? These little dudes run like 30, 40 miles an hour, and they can jump like 12 feet. That's pretty cool. And that tail, it's cute, but it'll knock you on your butt. Right? And these things, they know what? What is it? The, the, the cage match? What do they call that? UFC? Huh? UFC? These are UFC fighters. They'll rock back on that tail and box you and kick you. They'll thump you, right? <laughs> but they're so cute. They're so cute. I think Christians are cute. And you know what? They're armed and dangerous when they know the truth. And they're set, set free by that truth. Amen? Amen? They will put a, ma- a bad thumping on the devil if they've got a couple of verses in their repertoire. You hear me? Amen? So let us be like the kangaroo. Let's leap forward into some things this year. Let's stop focusing so much on the past. Matter of fact, you know what? Most Christians are focused on rebounding instead of abounding. You know, there's a word you need to almost get out of your your vocabulary, some of you, and it's called recovery. Recovery is not a lifelong process. Discovery is. Amen? That's why I don't believe you need 12 steps. I believe you need one major one. It's called a choice. And then you stand by that choice in the good times, in the bad times, in the easy times, and in the challenging times. You know, the other day I went to grocery shop for drop, and it's an amazing thing. I walked by Coors Light, and the stuff didn't leap off the shelf and pour itself down my throat. Didn't even get into my basket. I walked by the Copenhagen counter, and that stuff didn't fly out and jump into my lip. It's an amazing thing. So all this is not a disease. If so, I mean, I would be chewing right now. How can it be a disease? I didn't get a temperature. Show up to the doctor and go, I don't understand, I just can't stop chewing Copenhagen snuff tobacco. It's not a disease, it's a choice. See, it's a choice. People with heart disease didn't choose, oh, you know what, I want my heart to stop today. Now, they may have some small choices along the way with eating habits, but think about that. You know, elephantitis isn't a choice. It's a disease. Do you hear me? Isn't it amazing how science and some skewed interpretations of truth or facts can give us a philosophy that really doesn't make sense according to God's Word? For you not to have success in this life and enjoy this journey with Jesus Christ, it's skewed perception or a vain philosophy you're ruled by. Amen? Just say, oh, ouch. He's not preaching at me. He's preaching to the camera. Amen? Just just think about this. So, on a daily basis, there needs to be a dream in your heart that you're tracing your life toward. Some would call it, in the world, goal setting. I call it targets. Let me give you, if you're a goal setter, remember the goal is to inspire, not fire. Sometimes we set goals and we don't reach them, we fire the dream. We fire ourselves. We go, Donald Trump, you're fired to something you really want. No, it's not for that. Goal setting is to give you a track, a target, so you can trace your progress towards something. What do you do if you don't hit the goal? Simple. Duh. Duh. Change it. (laughs) I mean, come on. A goal should never be to your detriment. It should be for your advancement. Amen? Just some simple stuff. Watch. Are you allowing distractions to detour you? Who 
who's in charge of your life? Are you the master of your ship? Are you the leader of your life? Or are you on a, somebody else's journey? These are just questions I think that are valuable and, and, and we need to constantly keep before ourselves. What are the time wasters in your life? I have a bunch of them. Some of them I really like. So I'm going to keep those. The other ones, my wife often reminds me how I need to get rid of them. Yeah. Sometimes those time wasters have people's names attached to them. Right? Sometimes it has television games, game shows, sitcoms attached to them. Come on. I love television. I really do. TV is, a, I think, a great invention. It is, like, awesome. It's triumphant value. TV, triumphant value. But it can be a major time waster. Right? Just know the difference. Nothing has to be in a law for you to say, yes, yes, that's good or that's bad. No, no, we can be mature people and determine, you know, am I giving too much to this? Is that wasting too much of my time? Should I be utilizing that time elsewhere? Let me tell you something. Time off is good time. Because I find when I have time off, I get turned on. I get turned on to some things that, need to, that I need to focus on give my time to. I get turned on to some dreams that maybe I let go dormant. I get turned on to some promises that I forgot to speak out over my life. I get turned on to some insight and wisdom that I have a value that need, is needed in my community or in my sphere of influence. Do you hear me? Time off should turn you on. Amen? Praise God. Grace is back there. I'm her favorite preacher, so she's having a siesta back there right now. Amen? She's taking time off. Amen? Here's another one. People. Who are the detours in your life that are people? Who are they? I have some. Now, the next question, is it wrong to help them exit your life? No, not at all. Not at all. Well, that's just being shallow. That's not caring about others. It's absolutely caring about others. The question I have is, do they care for you? If they care for you, they value you. If they value you, they value your time. If they value you and your time, they value the time you guys spend together. There's been people in my life that I was training. I finally got tired of dialoguing. So I said, you better take notes. One guy couldn't take notes. I said, you better buy a, a DAT recorder. Because I'm going to say it one time, and after that, no more. And I physically made him carry a little. I wouldn't even say anything until it turned on. So I got tired of repeating myself. And his favorite word was just. But he said it like this, just. I'm like, I'm just about ready to fire you if you don't start doing your j job around here. True story. I've had some interesting characters in my life. And... Um, um, they fabricated the good person I am today. Watch this. And old paradigms leading you away from the next discovery. Old thought processes. Then instead of leading you toward discovery, um, innovation, intuitivism, it's leading you away to something else. Can't, won't, never will be. Come on. I'm so glad the guy that invented riding the horse didn't stay there. He allowed transportation to transition to cars. I'm so glad Henry Ford just didn't tell everybody the only way over the planet is in a car. Somebody came along, the, the brothers, and helped invent airplanes. What's the next discovery? Possible travel that will be at several thousand miles an hour. Do you understand there's a train already that they work on that is magnetically driven, sealed up in a tube like a straw? It becomes extremely efficient, flies faster than a jet on the ground. Imagine that. And takes about a third of the energy, if even that. All by magnetic, magnetic push and pull. 
What's the next thing? If you could raise your great-grandparents from the dead and say, here, here's a telephone, they would go, what's a telephone? Next, they'd go, what's this? If you took the next generation from them and you handed them your cell phone, they'd go, oh, a TV that I can put in my hand. Hear me. If all of this happened in the last hundred years, what will the next hundred years have for us? But if we're ruled by old paradigms, old thought processes, we'll never discover what is on the horizon of time that God has prepared for us. Amen? The man sitting at the, uh, the pool of Bethesda, his whole vision was if an angel shows up, he probably was like some, oh, well, I'm going to name that angel. I've got a name for it. Shut up. He's just wanting him to stir the water. And he was always late. Amen? Think about that. Somebody always beat him. If we are ruled by that mentality, we will never receive the healing Jesus Christ provided and that's available. And it's not based on an angel stirring. It's a based on you stirring up your tongue and believing by faith, stirring up your faith to the promise. Amen? That's how it comes. You may say, well, I've tried it once and it didn't work. Well, keep trying it because it may work that one time you really need it. Well, I spoke to my finances. It doesn't work. Well, why don't you speak to your credit cards and tell them to stay in your wallet? That helps. <laughs> Been there, had to do that. Amen? Yeah. Start right there. Before you know it, you'll be speaking to other things. You'll be speaking to your portfolio saying, you know what? You're not going to go down. You'll be speaking to wisdom. Give me the right understanding for this uh, economy, the one that we're presently in, the one that's on the horizon. You'll start speaking to, Lord, this thing that I have here that's dead, it needs to come alive. And you'll command it to come back to life. What is it? A dead dream. It can arise and change your future. It can. I think of the baseball players. Every time they go to the plate, they already know the odds are stacked against them. They know that. The good ones hit the ball about 27 to 28% of the time. The good ones. Right? Isn't that right, Richard? You're the Dodgers fan. Dodgers, they, they hit like 400%. Right? <laughs> I'm a Dodgers fan also. I don't know this giant stuff. Anyways, think about this. The good ones. I mean, you can make a living if you can hit 300% of the time or, or 30% of the time. Right? So how would you like to have to go to the plate knowing that everybody's watching? There's, I don't know, 40, 50,000 fans watching plus everybody on television, and I, I'm, I could strike out. That's embarrassing. And you did it the last time, and, and you may end up doing it this time also. You know? I don't know about you. I'd just jump in front of the ball. <laughs> Take one for the team. <laughs> At least you'll get the sympathy of the crowd, right? Anyway. But think about that. So you don't have it all that bad, do you? Because you're winning about 50 to 60% of every decision you make. You're not doing too bad. You try to launch out in business, one failed, but the next one made it. Look, you're making a living. Some people aren't even able to do that today. One thing I got to say about bad economies, at least we survived it. Now we're getting to thrive in the next one. Amen? Amen. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Hey, if the devil could have destroyed you, you wouldn't be here today. Right? Tim wouldn't have a hip. Right? Mandy and Richard would be still stuck in Texas. Right? Glad you're home, by the way. Richard would have never got off that Texas Longhorn. I had to tell him, hey, that's not a Harley. Get your hands off the horn. Doesn't have a clutch. Right? Where would you be today? Peter would be trying to sell a mini blind to somebody that doesn't want one. Right? Diana would be trying to sculpt somebody's head and telling them by a lie, you actually look pretty. That takes faith. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, you know, a hairstylist never tells you when they gap the back of your head. You'll always know because they never offer you a mirror. Amen? Right? If you think they're poking back there because they're trying to get it right, no, they're trying to hide something they messed up. 
But think about this. And God's delivered us from all these things. And he's supersized us because he's pushing us towards our dream. Amen? Now Richard can actually play the lottery. I think, can't you? You still can't. Oh, you do? Oh, Richard, I'll buy you tickets. Jeez. So if we weren't able to change our paradigm, we would have been stuck in our past. Our ladies would still be overseas in a foreign country. Here they get to come and, and enjoy our country, become w with us, right? Americans with us, get to worship with us. Amen? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I think of my wife. She would still be eating six months old fish. And yeah, they use ammonia to bring you back when you've passed out. That's what they're trying to do in Iceland. Raise people from the dead with that stuff. It stinks, man. Whew. Anyways. Watch this. Old data and old reasonings rob too many Christians. Old data and reasonings, old reasonings. Now, when I say old data, I am not talking about the, the Scripture, the Word of God. I'm talking about other data points that they tried to put with the Scripture to give it a different type of interpretation. Amen? Put this in your notes. The word abound is a verb. Many times we look at it as a noun, but it's actually a verb. It means something that, a word that is active. Right? It's in motion. The Greek word, I like this. It's parisio. Parisio. But I like the part in the middle where it's you. Parisio. O. Look at that. We get the word persistence out of this word. And persistence would be your persistent you. And O. Oh. Watch. Persistent. But whenever you become persistent, oh, that's good. It's like Yahoo. Right? Does that make sense? So the word persistence with this Greek word means an individual that's persistent in motion and therefore they're abounding. Now, let me give you the definition. To occur or exist in great quantities or number. Or numbers. To be rich or well supplied. Look at this. To be filled. Excel to the better. One even says to accelerate. I like the last one. Enough to spare. Enough to spare. When you're tired, I have enough to spare. When you don't have energy, I have enough to spare. When you're lacking in finances, I have enough to spare. Well, I don't, Pastor. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. If God's Word says so, you do. Amen? Yeah. Put this in your notes. Let's stop rebounding and learn how to abound. Too many people are on a rebounder of life. My wife has a rebounder. When we watch TV, she jumps on her little rebounder, and she just says, I go, would you just jump? Would you like get some air? I want to heat, see you hit the ceiling. But she doesn't. She just does this. I'm like, what fun is that? She kind of looks like those Pentecostals that bounce all the time. But she just does this. I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, I'm just moving. I'm thinking, yeah, but really rebound. How about abound? Maybe if, if she abounded, she'd fly through the roof. Amen? But she's rebounding. And watch. What it is is a perpetuated movement that goes up and down, up and down. Too many Christians have a perpetual movement in their life. They go up a little bit and down a little bit, up a little bit and down a little bit. Their whole life and walk of faith is up and down, up and down, up and down. So they invent stupid songs like, I'm thankful for the valley. Blah, 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 blah. It's like stupid. If you don't know that song, good. You don't need to learn it. Do you know what I'm talking about, some of you? It's like, because their whole world is dark and getting darker. Amen? Oh, how is it? I'm thankful for the mountaintop. I don't know. Anyways, it's, a, it's like... 
Just, yeah, this little light of mine. And you like, and this little light of mine, can let it shine. What about a floodlight, amen? Keep your bick and let's get something bigger, amen? I'm about slipped right there. Anyways, <laughs> think about this. <laughs> the other morning we were getting ready, drop a night, and, and I started singing a song that we used to sing, Deep and Wide, Deep and, deep and Wide. And, and, but think about it. Most Christians have this kind of dialogue, up and down, up and down, up and down. Rebound, 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 rebound. What about abounding? What would life be if you could always succeed and never look back? Always accelerate forward, never have a drawback? What would it be like if you always moved higher and no retraction? What would that be like? Sometimes I believe the church, the early church, created people that would believe for a failure instead of believers that would believe for greater outcomes all the time. Greater success. We can talk about greater grace. What about greater success? Greater achievement. Greater acceleration. Amen? Greater beyond what we could have imagined, hoped for, or even thought possible. Amen? Sometimes we take something and we'll put a religious term on it or, or statement to it and we can't comprehend the revelation of it. What is greater grace? It's all of the endowment of God accelerating on your behalf to launch you into a future you've been believing for by faith. Amen? Come on. My, look at Matthew. Look at what Jesus said. I'm about ready to get on a soapbox big time. It's going to be called Tide. <laughs> Matthew 12, 35. Watch. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. That word brings forth, translation, abounds. Watch. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth or abounds evil things. Okay? Okay? So here we have abound, and through the carnal self, through evil, sin awareness, sin consciousness, rebound. Can I tell you what a rebound is in basketball? The first guy missed the shot. So what are we saying as Christians whenever we're always rebounding? We're missing our first shot. We're missing, 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 missing the mark. We pray a miss. I don't want to pray a miss. I want to pray a target hit the bullseye. Amen. Amen? And if I don't know how to pray that, I'm going to shut up until I learn how to pray it so when I open my mouth, I'm effective. Does that make sense? Amen? Matter of fact, I love my wife. I'm glad that she's a woman of the Word because when Darren's mouth and tongue start speaking stupid, she's the first one that bridles and says, excuse me, shut up, up in here. Up in here. Yeah. You know why? Because she understands the power of words. And over the years, I've learned the power of words too and the power of her backhand. Power of words are better. Amen. <laughs> For all of you viewing, no, she does not hit me. No. Anyways, hard. On purpose. <laughs> Anymore. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Put this in your notes. Jesus is showing... Two categories of people or persons. A good man, a good woman, an evil man or woman. Two categories. And see, he would rather us operate in the first. That's why he's stated first instead of the second. He's trying to draw um, a comparison. He's telling you that two individuals are capable of producing something. The question is what and of what origin or type. Amen? Praise God. Look at this. Notice both treasures. They're not held in reserve. They're flung forward. Do you see that in the verse? Brings forth. Right? They're brought out or brought forward. This is where we can get the word abound. Out of the good treasure of heart, the good person abounds. Things fling forward out of their life just as the bad person in this passage, right? The evil person. Have you ever been around people and it's just really hard to love them or even like them? Because most of the time you're dodging the bullets that come out of their mouth. 
You're, dodge, you're literally dodging the statements. And then if you, if you miss the statement, then there's this aroma of just black, dark negativity. You ever be around people like that? Hopefully not for long, right? But I've been around people like that. No matter when you meet them, they never have a good day. They always have a dreary day. They will always find the negative and the bad in every situation. Think about that. Those are fitting moments for you to have an emergency at home. Those are fitting moments for you to tell your friend or your spouse, just text me and tell me you need me to go do something. Invent something. Be my guest. There's times that I'll text her up and say, you do have something for me to do, right? And she'll text me, yes. Could you go by the store and get the... Gotta go! You hear me? You cannot afford the price of receiving someone else's negativity. You hear me? Moving on. We want to abound. If we're going to abound, remember I said there are things that weight us down. These are things that will weight us down. Right? Moving on. Put this in your notes. I believe God puts a desire inside of all of us so that we can evaluate ourselves in the light of His Word in order to become all that He created us to be. Victoria Osteen said that. Imagine being in a household. Imagine being around friends where it's positive and they see you as an overachiever. What would that world be like for you? How effective could you be? What kind of unlimited potential may, may you uh, begin to function in? Think about that. Talking abounding. When we have the kangaroo, you know, the kangaroo doesn't walk like a rabbit. No. A rabbit uses his four legs. Kangaroo doesn't do that. Uses his tail and his legs. Totally different. They bounce. Amen? Please put this in your notes. You can only fix what is correctly, correctly evaluated. You can only fix what's correctly evaluated. In dealing with people, I have tried to help them through different things or, and, and fix things. But you can truly only fix what they're willing to appraise and evaluate correctly good or bad, then you have the power to fix it. Because after that point, you move to resolution. How do we resolve this? How can we move forward? Conflict with relationships. Hey, I have them. No question about it. You got to go to ask people to forgive you. You got to change the way you dialogue with them. You know, it takes effort. When you slip up, you make up. Does that make sense? Amen. But if you're always looking through a skewed checklist, you'll never be able to fix the problem. Watch. Many people skew the checklist because they can't handle the pain of reality or truth. See, many would think it's easy to teach people, it's easy to disciple people, it's easy to train and develop people. It's only easy to the extent they allow you access into what they truly believe. That's it. Because if they're of a different opinion, if they're of a different philosophy, if they're under, of a different belief system, if they are of a different insight than whatever topic you're trying to dialogue and help them in, they will not move forward in a greater truth. It's the way it is. You can take people that are in sales, and if they actually believe the economy's bad and nobody's buying, their sales pitch will run people away from them instead of drawing people to them like magnets. There's a man by the name of Tommy Hopkins, and he talks about the art of selling. And um, it should be literally the art of communication. And he was talking about when he was a real estate agent, he was given this development that had a train trestle, a train track right in the very back of it. And it was um, after the interest rates got so high and people just weren't buying real estate, you know. 
And so he set out in this real estate career and he wanted to be a success. Well, he has this development and every time somebody would come there, the first thing they would notice is the train tracks and the sound of the train and how annoying it was. So him being a good salesperson, he said, hey, this can either destroy me or it can be to my benefit. And so what he started to understand is the trains, as we know them, are fading away. This is a thing of the old frontier. And so he would light the fireplace in his model home, have, you know, the cookies, the chocolate, and all the nice things. And then he would structure all of his meetings to the time that the train would come right across your backyard. And then he would just prepare the people. In a moment, you're going to get to experience something of yesteryear, something from long ago that very few people can ever enjoy again. And he said, <laughs> he said, the ground would start to shake. You know, when the trains get ready to come through, you start hearing a roar. And he would just build the excitement and then have everybody turn and look right out the plate glass windows. And here would come this blistering chain across their backyard, this train. Woo! And he'd go, isn't that great? And you can buy one of these. He said, I turned a dog um, development into a place of success. Totally turned it around, all in how he changed the perception of the viewer. Imagine that. Incredible. I listened to his art of selling so many times, I literally wore the tapes out to where they would just break. I thought that was phenomenal. If you can get somebody to see the value in buying a piece of property with the train track in the very backyard that's going to wake you up all different times of the night and they're willing to pay a premium for it, you are one special man. And I better listen to you. Amen? What am I saying? To many, the glass is half full or half empty. Which one are you? Right? Which one are you? Right? I mean, think about that. He talked in one of his series about a man that had been burned over his entire body and decided to go into politics. Think about that. I'm talking about abounding, friends. People just like you and I that overcome incredible odds and challenges. Burned over his entire body. Disfigured. His face totally disfigured. And he was wondering, how in the world am I going to go into politics? But that's the deep desire of my heart. People won't even want to look at me. True. So you want to know what his line was? Send me to Washington, and I promise I won't be just another pretty face. He went door to door and won and ended up in Washington, D.C., do you hear me? What's wrong with you, God could be saying it's what's right with you. Amen? Let me say it one more time. What's wrong with you, God may be saying is what's right with you. You just haven't come into your time just yet. You just haven't put your gift before the right people just yet. You're just around people that may not understand you just yet. You're living in your future and they're living in their past. Put that in your notes. I'm about ready to invite you to join Amway right now. <laughs> Hear me. Sometimes we're perceiving things from such a skewed point of view, we don't see the value of the treasure God put in us. Yeah. Amen? I'm telling you, you're more than an overcomer. When I think of these individuals that come to our country and, and they leave home and family and friends to go to another nation for opportunity or some view that they have of our beautiful country. I'm telling you, it blows my brain and inspires my heart. I know what my wife went through to become an American citizen. Amen? I know that. It's incredible. And I go back to her country. It's absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And I ask, why? And she looks at me and says, because of you. I went, is there any other choice? <laughs> but we often wonder, what would it have been like if we never met? Would she be a believer or a Christian today? Would we have the children we have? 
If I would have had another wife, she had another husband. What would our offspring be? Would we experience the life that we have? And let me tell you something. You don't have to have a lot of money in the bank to be happy. It's a choice of your state of mind and state of heart. Amen? I'll never forget when we were so broke we had to share the same ice cream. And I don't like sharing anything. But it was fun with her. Do you hear me? I remember when we could just take a few quarters and go down to the local ice cream shop and play Pac-Man. And she got so good at it, I would just sit and watch her. And I would just watch Pac-Man eat things around. I'm like, man, I wish I could play it that good. I just got so <laughs> enthralled with watching my wife play Pac-Man. Amen. Caleb grew up watching my wife play Donkey Kong. Was that what it was? No, Crash Bandicoot. He actually thought it was a cartoon on TV. So he was a little toddler and he said, Mama, Crash, Crash, come on, what's Crash? So he thought we turned the TV on and Crash Bandicoot cartoon came on. It was his mom playing the game. She would get so dizzy playing at a time. She's like, Darren, I, I'm dizzy. I can't even see anymore. It was amazing. See, sometimes our perception becomes our reality. What reality are you living in? Is it abounding or rebounding? Let me put it like this. Is it abounding and resounding? Or is it a nightmare? We can only fix what we correctly evaluate. <clears throat> put this in your notes. Change is inevitable if we want to be a person of value and depth. You can be a person of no value and shallow. And it doesn't require any change on your behalf. Now, the older I'm getting, now that I'm 50, I like to be around real old men. Because they make me feel young. <laughs> they still look at me like just a pup. I'm like, you're right. I wait until I turn 50. <laughs> anyway, no, I, I really do. The reason being is I value depth. I, I value depth of conversation before I didn't have time to listen to it. I value depth of conversation. And I remember growing up, though, with my grandfather, I, one thing I valued about him was the depth of conversation. Now, it was hillbilly. It centered around farming. It centered around guns. It centered around hunting. But there was some wisdom there. And I appreciated the wisdom and certainly all the stories. Now God's put some men in my life that are older, mature, that have been a success in their given fields and endeavors. And the depth of conversation is something I really, really value. I got to be with two of them yesterday. It's incredible. I loved it. I told Drop, I could have sat there all night long listening to these two guys talk about different things and politics and the law and things going on. It's because that's their world. And sometimes we can gain wisdom through the life experience of others. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says this, but we have this treasure. Circle that. When you see that a positive heaven as something as easy to reach and attain, something of, uh, that costs you very little, sometimes you devalue it. But the Bible says it's treasure. And I believe that what God put on the inside of you once you received Christ and the Holy Spirit filled you, I believe He deposited something in you of great treasure and of great value. It's sad to say most people never discover the depth of it and its true worth. Never be a surface person. Be a depth person. Does that make sense? Never be a surface person. It goes on to say that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. See, a shallow person never transitions to discover the excellence of the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. It always becomes self-driven, self-absorbed, self-reflective. See, when we understand that we can mine the treasure of that excellence of the Holy Spirit that's within all of us, I believe that's when the true power of the Holy Spirit will be manifest through our life. Amen? 
It, imagine this. Sometimes we love the movement of Holy Spirit more than the maturing and transformation of the Holy Spirit. And I'm starting to like the second one. I really am. Hey, I, I, I understand what it's like to be anointed. I love those kind of meetings. But let me tell you something. I see a long-term deposit as maturity and transformation. That sometimes you don't get in the moment of the movement of Holy Spirit. Now, his desire is to move you and groove you so that you're transformed. But most people just like the movement instead of the, the work that follows. Amen? Watch this. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Here, here's, here's true value. The Holy Spirit residing within us. Next, God's, or the Holy Spirit's gifts that God placed within you. What kind of gifts? Start discovering those. What are the depth of them? You know, some, well, I got tongues. And, then, and they blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's great. We lo I love that. Don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But are we experiencing the magnitude of it? What if that tongue changes? What if all of a sudden it goes into great, great moans and groans of spiritual understanding that you don't have in your human intellect? What happens if you're speaking a language with God and He's releasing things based on those moments in that communication in the earth in places you may never end up in or go to? What if you're being an instrument of heaven because you just chose to spend time with God and utter things you don't even understand? So I love the Holy Spirit. But now what if all of a sudden that transition to interpreting what if a transition to prophesy and interpretation? Meaning all that God and I talked about, now I can articulate into human language where people can grab a hold of it in whatever language they speak. That's also awesome. And I don't believe we have to uh, sacrifice one for the other. I believe we can have all of it in total. Does that make sense? Talking of value. Faith that is usable and expandable. How valuable is that? A faith that started as a measure or a morsel and yet becomes great faith that is mountain moving. Raises the dead. Makes the sun stand still. Makes the clouds forbid to give rain and all of a sudden makes them gush it out. These are the different examples of faith we have from Genesis to Revelations. And the book of Acts is still working through people like you today acting on what God said, and seeing great outcomes. Amen? Is this good so far? Amen. Watch this. Heavenly peace. Jesus said, I give this to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. This peace is from heaven. It's His peace that He gave to us. His peace. How valuable is that? Watch this. How about this one? Absolute truth. Full of direction, wisdom, and insight, he gave us the word. It is an absolute truth. I have no tolerance for people that want to sit and debate whether the word of God is authentic. I have none. If you want to be defaced from my Facebook, that's the quickest way right there. Defriended. <laughs> Seriously. Done. <laughs> Out of here. I even report them at times. Hey, this is spam right there, man. I, somebody was on my face page talking rubbish the other day. If it's racist, you're gone. Simple. If it's racist, you're gone. If it's anti-Jesus, anti-Christ, you're gone. Hear me right now. If it's abusing another person, you're gone. If it's some kid that probably needs to be spanked, slapping down somebody that's an adult, you're done. Defriend. And then I just report them. This is violent, and I don't believe it needs to be on Facebook. That's my prerogative. Right? Come on. Here's my rule. If I wouldn't let my kids do it in my home to their elders or other people of value, then I don't need to watch it and I don't need to entertain it. Amen. Simple. And I look at most of those kids, that's not freedom of speech. That is, you need to be disciplined. You need parents to care enough about you to tell you shut up and sit down. And this is the way it works. Right? Amen. Amen. Moving on. Another soapbox. Put this in your notes. 
As Christians, we are wealthy vessels of honor if we evaluate the potential of our inner treasure. That's what that verse said. That these earthen vessels, these human containers, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of the earthen vessel. Is he diminishing the earthly vessel? Not at all. He just says there's an excellent power that can work through it that he wanted to draw attention to. Amen? Don't let the feelings steal the power of the truth. Put that in your notes. Don't let the feelings steal the power of the truth. Sometimes we can get caught up in our feelings and we will reject the truth of God's Word that can heal us and help us. Sometimes we'll get caught up in the emotion of what God is doing in the environment and the atmosphere and we'll miss the truth He's trying to seed into our heart. Amen? Acts 1.8 Jesus said, But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The power comes after. Power before is of the self, the self nature, the man, the human nature. This is speaking of a different power. Jesus said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. What type of power? How is that different than the human strength? Can I live by that power on a daily basis? Is it something that God desires me to have? Let me put it to you like this. If God didn't desire for you to have that power, Jesus wouldn't have given it to you or said it. Jesus would not have stated it. Holy Spirit wouldn't give it to you. Does that make sense? And you shall be witnesses, circle that, unto me, both in Jerusalem. Look at the key word, both. I had to fight the mentalities of some peers around me uh, about 20 years ago because they didn't see the word both in this text. They felt you shall receive power and be a witness just in my church only and in the parking lot and only bring people here. But don't ever go away on a missions trip. How, why would God want to send you somewhere else? The mission's filled right here. Why fly over it? Like that's real simple because he said both. None, well, no one's excluded. But, 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 no. Great Commission, it said, both. I said, I think the greater pass of, uh, impasse of this verse is number one, we're filled with Holy Spirit power. And number two, we become witnesses. Now, my job is to become witness worthy. Hey, if I'm on trial, I don't want just any old witness going up there and babbling. I want to make sure they're saying the truth, right? I'm sure Jesus is concerned about what the witnesses are saying that are sharing about him. What are they saying? What are they sharing? Are they viable witnesses? Do they really know me? Or are they just using cleft notes? Moving on. Man, it got quiet in our church. Look at this. You shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Those remote places. So all-inclusive. See, I don't believe you can be effective abroad if you can't be effective at home. I get that understand, understanding in that argument. But I also believe this. Sometimes you'll be very effective abroad and it will help you when you come home to be even more effective here. I wish I had an endless budget. I would pick everybody up in this building, put you in a plane, and send you away for about seven days to hop, skip, and jump around the earth so you can come home and just tell me of all that you saw Jesus do. I really do. It's awesome. It's life-changing. They've been to nations. It's life-changing. Life-changing. And it puts meaning into why we do what we do as North American Christians and sacrifice and give and, and study the Word to show ourselves approved unto God, being able to articulate the truth as it is. It, it, it puts it all in perspective. Talking with my daughter. She's moved in, into the city in London. And we're talking about spirit-filled churches. There's only like three or four 
in a group of 9 million people, you're blessed. You can pick up the Fresno Yellow Pages and turn pages of charismatic type churches, worship centers. She has three or four to choose from that people know about. Now, there may be others in, that don't advertise or don't have any you know, thumbprint in the community. But imagine that. Spain. In Madrid, Spain. Looking for a church for my son. That whole region, several million people. The Epcot of Spain. I found one church that has our type of praise and worship and may or may not be Spirit-filled. One. One. We are very, very, very blessed. And we have a great mission ahead of us as the local church. Amen? Can you take a little bit more? Okay. Five minutes. Promise. Watch this. First, you receive power to change you. I thought I received power to change drop. I had a quick vision that said it would take me and all the angels of heaven to change her. Her assignment is to change her. I'll never forget praying, going, God, would you change her? Please, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'll never forget Visalia going out by my swimming pool and praying in tongues and saying, oh, Jesus, God, would you just change my wife? I'm being honest. Would you change my wife? Lord, would you just make her start helping me at church? I remember praying all this. But then I remember saying, she's my daughter. When I'm ready, she'll do what I ask of her. I'm like, <laughs> make that now, God, please, Shundai, Shikabaya. <laughs> Suddenly, true story though, but I'll never forget, the more I started praying, Lord, help me to prepare her. Help me to have insight to lead her. Help me to be that helpmate. God, change my heart in these areas I know I'm failing in. I started seeing God change my wife and transform her. And one day she came to me and she said, I'm now ready to take my responsibility and start helping you teach and develop and help the people in our church. Imagine that. And she's not stopped. It became very simple. The 11th commandment is when I ask her to preach, she goes, I will when God says so. Okay. So it's real simple. I go to Snapchat and talk to God. No. No. <laughs> Some people ask, why, why didn't drop teach more? Pray. Because she hears God's voice and she'll only do it when God tells her to and gives her the message. I appreciate that about her. I do. I really do. I wish I could have that a lot. Like, Lord, I could preach about every eight weeks. That'd be good. Because I love to receive. But hey, God has you right where he needs you. Allow him to cultivate the treasure within you. Amen? Moving on. Look at this. I love this. So we talked about the power to change us. And once we're changed and transformed, it's amazing there's a transition that will take place. Watch. That change becomes the testimony when we start to witness. You start to share. This is where I was. Here's how God changed my life. And it will resonate with others and they'll want what you have. Stop talking about your troubles and start talking about His triumphs. When you start saying, you know what? This is what God did for me. And I know He can do it for you. People are willing to receive your message. Watch. Sharing is caring. If we see sharing as caring, we'll regulate what we share. People that care about you, they're not there to dump everything on you. They're not. But never forget, sharing is caring. When you share the word, when you share what God can do and how God can help and what he wants to do for them, 
that's caring about the person. Amen? There is nothing in the Word that says you can be a silent witness. If you're a witness for me, don't keep your mouth shut. If I'm on trial and you're a witness, let it be known. Speak the truth. Bring, bring it forward. Because my life may be in the balance. Now, the thought of, well, I'm just going to be a silent witness. No, that's simply saying, I don't want the responsibility to share the truth and to care for someone else. Wow. Now, I'm not talking about being ev evasive and, and bulldo you know, bulldozing people. I'm talking about refusing to share when you have insight that has the power to help. Amen? John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If there's a testimony for people that we should be sharing because we care, it's that verse right now. A lot of people's hearts are troubled and living in fear, but not you and I, we're believers. We know God's got it in control and God's working some things out. Amen. And I do believe this. There's some great things on the horizon. I'm telling you, I believe that. I believe our nation is going to change in some areas. I believe the economy is going to take off and spring forward in some areas. Do you hear me? I believe there's going to be some debt canceling time periods just ahead of us for the believer. I believe things you've been believing for, speaking and putting towards and sowing towards and building up is getting ready to spring forth and abound concerning you. I believe that. I believe that. I will go to my grave believing next year is the best year I'll ever experience. Amen? I may do that so much that I don't ever die. Wouldn't that be something? Just have to be one of those that sees Jesus come through the clouds. That'd be all right with me. Amen? Who says we got to die at 100? Come on now. My wife's trying to pickle me. I could probably get 150 out of this thing right now. She's buying an extended warranty on me. Trust me called a life insurance policy. Amen? Isn't that amazing? They call it life insurance? should be death insurance, right? So that's what it means, Richard. She buys that so I can live longer, right? The insurance company's in cahoots with me. They're like, yes, keep paying the premium. Live, boy, live. <laughs> Amen? They're faith-based. <laughs> they probably pray every day over all their policyholders. I want all of them to live till they're 150. Amen. Keep that premium coming in. Keep tithing to us the premium. Amen. Come on, have fun in church. Watch this. This peace comes from Christ and not of the world. So look at its origin. If it doesn't come from God, you don't have to have it and take it. Right? This world's troubles will try to steal your peace and rob your joy all the time. Not some of the time. All the time. The headline news wants to be your headquarters for insight and information. No, you don't have to make it that. You don't. Watch this. Oh, side note. Do you think this is the first presidential race God has ever seen? Do you think this is the first election where God's looking at the candidates and going, No. But God's still in control. He even used Nebuchadnezzar. Go and look through some of the people in the Old Testament. He used a lot of funky people. And it didn't detour his plan for his people either. Look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh stole from them, enslaved them, and beat them for 450 years. God said, oh, I saw that lashing. That's another dividend for the Israelites. I saw that beating. Oh, yeah, there's some more gold transferring across the line. And when they left Egypt, they bankrupt Egypt. 450 years of wage earned on the backs of their forefathers came trekking out of Egypt, willfully given by Pharaoh. Why? He wanted to pay the price so the curse stopped. Amen? Amen. Wow. What would happen if that hit Washington? I'd run to the mailbox. I'd sit in front of that mailbox and say, I'm believing it. Get it in there. That check's coming. Right? <laughs> Amen. 
Watch. God is always preparing to do great things to good people. You're his people and he calls you good. Whenever he created man, he looked back and blessed it and said it is good. Yeah. Moving on. Never allow trouble or fear into your heart. Never. Remember, Jesus gave his peace, but you still have to receive it. Romans 15, 13. Almost finished. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy. Circle that. Some of us just believe to have enough joy so we feel good when we go home. No, all joy. When you're filled with all joy, you don't have bad hair days. They may present themselves, but you don't act them out. Amen? The other day, I, I'm telling you, I looked at my I was so catty. I was so just like grumpy. I just looked at her and said, I just need Starbucks. I went and got me a cup of God's joy over at Starbucks. <laughs> Transform my life. Amen? Hey, whatever it takes, you don't have to act on what's being presented to you. You can act on the Word. You can withdraw yourself so you can launch forward with self. Does that make sense? Amen? Praise God. Rather go buy a cup of Starbucks than say something to those that I love that I really don't mean in the first place. Right? Right? I remember one day I got up on the, I got up in a bad mood. She looked at me. She goes, "Why don't you go back to bed and try the other side?" I'm like, "Okay, I'll do that." <laughs> Amen. It's working. 27 years, still moving forward. Two things, two steps. Watch this, uh, Romans 15:13. Now the may the God of of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. He didn't say in your doubts. He didn't say in speaking of doubt and unbelief. He said in believing that you may abound. There's the abound word. In hope. See, hope that's abounding doesn't make the heart sick. Deferred hope makes the heart sick. They're totally different. Abounding hope is always accelerating, right? It's existing in great quantity and number. It's rich and well supplied. It's filled and full. It's excellent. It's better than it was before. Amen? Amen. Abounding in hope through the power, and that's the key. So number one, we're filled with abounding hope. And second, we release it. We operate in it. We function in it by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Amen? And Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule your hearts to which we're, we're called into one body and be thankful. I'm telling you, when we understand the power that we're called into one body, it's easy to be thankful. It's easy to be thankful. We are in one body and that body is the body of Christ. We are fit in the right spot Amen? In the body of Christ. We are set in heavenly places far above all rulers of darkness and wickedness and all these evil and wicked things. We're set there, placed there, just like a missing piece in a puzzle was the people and the church, and God set it in there right in Christ Jesus. And because of that, we have hope, and because of that, we're always abounding. Amen?